We begin a new series today on soul stewardship. Soul stewardship. Before I do, I want to tell you how great God is. I'm going to tell you a story that by some people's standards would be sad, but I'm going to tell you it's victorious and it's joyous. So I'll start with that story. So Friday we were at Wrightsville Prison. I would not know about Wrightsville Prison had it not been for Danny Cox and Frank McDuffie beginning over and over again, talking to us and asking us to be a part and going through the process to make sure that you're approved to go in there. And April of last year was my, my first time to be there with them. And some of you know the story, but I need to tell it again so that everybody can get the punchline of today. God always has a purpose, amen? He doesn't leave us wondering. He's a revelator. How many don't just want knowledge, you want revelation? Amen? amen? Praise God. If Adam and Eve would have figured it out that they didn't need to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that God was very able to reveal to them good and evil, they would not have had the trouble that they, they went through. We were, uh, so we were there in April, and I walked through, and, and they, they will have a line of the prisoners, the inmates, that will be the greeters. And if you understand anything about Wrightsville Prison, you will know, if you've heard about it, you will know that it is a gospel-centered, Jesus Christ-focused prison. They don't take any type of public money. They raise $25,000 a year for each inmate. There's 200 inmates, and you do the math. But the governor said, we want this program in Arkansas. And so now the recidivism rate, the rate of which people go back into prison, their recidivism rate is half that of the rest of the prisons in Arkansas. Thank God's doing some stuff. And so we're there and, and, and we're, we're going through the line of these inmates that have accepted Christ and they're greeting us like our door greeters will do you here. They're just enjoying. Now go down the line. The, the thing is, is they wear a name tag too. It's permanent. It's always on their uniform. And I go down about four or five and I noticed my name, Curtis. My last name. And I said, Curtis, well, that's my name. I said, I'm not going to forget you today. And he introduced his, his first name to me. I'm Darren, and Darren Curtis. And he goes, and he said, well, that's pretty neat. And I said, well, is your family in Arkansas? And he goes, yeah, we, we were down south, and I've been, uh, you know, here for a while and, in, in prison. And I said, well, my family was around south. I, I, uh, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we lived in England. He said, England? Really? He said, do you know a Willoughby? And I said, Willoughby in England? He, That's my uncle. He said, no. He said, you know Huell and Buell? I said, Buell is my daddy. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got my third cousin, and I'm meeting him, and I'd never met him before. Never knew his name. And so I'm right there. I, I do that, and, and we go, and, and we... We sit down and, and, and we move into this row and there's this, this tall, good-looking, young African-American man and he walks by and he goes, you mind if I sit right here? And I said, no, man, sit here. So I got Darren on this side and, and I've got Walter on this other side. And, and Walter looks at me and, and, he, and he, goes, he goes, so what do you do? Because he knew I wasn't in one of the uniforms. <laughs> He goes, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he goes, well, where do you pastor? In Fayetteville. He said, oh, that's good. He said, what church do you pastor? I said, live in faith church. He said, that's my church. I said, no. You're kidding. He said, no. He said, that's my church. I call that my church. He said, you see, at eight years old, a guy named Frank Lofton brought a bus and come down there and would pick me up every Wednesday. And I got to go to Wednesday church. And for a year before my family moved, I was at your church. And living faith is my church. Now you tell me what are the odds that I meet a family member 
and a church family member, and I'm sitting in the middle of them the first time I'm there. What does that tell me? We make our plans, but God orders our steps. Okay. He does. And so I am excited about that, and I'm rejoicing with that, but there's a little bit of a problem. Because I am in the program as one of the mentor leaders that come, one thing I cannot do is have conversation with any of the inmates outside of the prison. They cannot email me. They cannot send me a note. They cannot call me or text me. I can't do that to them. If I do that, I lose all my privileges. So I could not talk to Darren, and Darren would say, you're going to come the next time. I said, I'm going to try. The truth of the matter was I didn't get to. I didn't get to go back until just Friday. I walk in Friday, and let me just back up. Around July, July 7th or 8th, if I look at my text, I'll be able to see it, but somewhere around that area, I end up getting a text message from a number that says, is this Pastor Steve from Living Faith Church? And I said, yes, it is. He said, I am Darren. I am your cousin, Uncle Willoughby's grandson, and I have gotten out of prison. I've been freed, and I am in Hot Springs. We begin to rejoice. A week later, he sends me a picture. He said, he said, he said, Steve, he said, look at this. And there's this car, pictures of, of, of a car. And he goes, God has absolutely given me this car. He has given me a job. And I am doing so well. And praise be to God for what he's doing in my life. And man, we rejoice together. I congratulate him. We rejoice together. And I did not hear anything more at all. And I walked in Friday, and Scott, the, the, the leader, he said, man, I'm so sorry. And I said, sorry, what? He said, well, you, you know about, the, about Darren. And he began to tell me the details, and the details I did not know. 28 days after he was let out of prison, he had a stroke, and he died, and he went to be with the Lord. Don't no, don't go all. See, what we got to understand is that for the believer, we cry when people are born and we rejoice when people die. We get it the opposite. Okay? So here's what I know is that almost a year after my own dad passed away, now my, my third cousin is now rejoicing with my dad in heaven and they're getting to meet and talk about and by the way Willoughby his grandpa is there in heaven and so were all of the other uh, grand, great uncles of his and aunts of his except for one and that one's still living here Uncle Roy because when my grandmother, whom I never met, my grandmother said, Lord, I am asking you, if, there's, if you don't do anything for me, save my children. They are lost without you, but before they die, you save every one of my children. She died when my dad was 11. He put his hand over the casket and touched her nose that had a mole on it. She was a three-quarter Cherokee Indian woman. And he put his finger on her nose and on that mole, and he said, Mama, the next time I touch you, I'll be with you in heaven forever. My dad said that when he was 11. He's with his mama. Now, she prayed that, but how many of you understand that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so my grandmother prayed for her children to be saved, but what she didn't know is that because they were being saved that the branches of righteousness were growing bigger and her great-great-grandson was being saved. I'm waiting. 
you say, well, look, and by the way, when we get here in church, don't you clap like you're tinkling a glass. Okay? Let's rejoice like this is a whole lot better than the Dallas Cowboys winning. Amen? Uh There's more to this. Okay? (laughs) I'm working on him. The Dallas Cowboys winning may be improbable. But what is not is that one of these days Jesus Christ is returning. And when he returns, if you'll just accept him, no matter where you've been in your life and what circumstance you've been in, God will see you and he will save you now so he can save you then. How many of you believe it in the name of Jesus? He saved you then. He's saving you now. Hallelujah. Glory Glory to God. Mm. Now I'm just a little bit envious that the trumpet hadn't sounded yet. I'm going to back this thing up and I'm going to ask you, do you believe this? Do you believe that God ordained the events of life and would do whatever it would take to bring some lost person back to him? Thank you, Pastor. Because he is after your soul that began with him. Your soul is not yours. And so I need to give you some prophecy. And then I'm going to segue into the series at the end of soul stewardship. Because we're going to have to prepare ourselves for what God is going to do. But I want you to repeat after me four words. Release. Release. Restore. Restore. Revive. Revive. Return. Return. Say it again. Release. Release. Restore. Restore. Revive. Return. A prophetic word, and, and I'm just going to tell you that, that it took a, a couple of days or three for me to clear my mind when I was there on my vacation so that God could talk to me so clearly. I thought it was interesting that they told me, I, said, these, I asked them, I said, these guys ever get to use their phones when they come in here? He said, phones? They don't own phones here in prison. For the first 18 months of the program, they don't get to watch TV, period. They got a library that's got some books and maybe a newspaper. That's it. I think there's a point to that. It takes a little while for us to get this world unclogged from us. We're hearing a lot of things and we're seeing a lot of things. And and, and God can't even, no, it's not that he can't speak. We can't listen because we got so much other stuff in our minds and in our brains. Okay? It's what he did for me when I was sitting out there on the beach and he began to download some prophetic things. And if you remember last week, I told you that the voice of the Lord says the wait is over. Holy Spirit resources have been assigned and stored for Living Faith Church, for your family, for you individually, for Northwest Arkansas. There have been Holy Spirit resources stored up waiting for this moment, and now they are being released. God said, just as I opened the windows of heaven for Israel and manna fell, just as I opened the belly of a rock and water flowed, the inventory of my favor and provision is being released now. The wait is over. That's the word of God. Now the second portion, and In the next coming weeks, I'm going to give you three and four. I don't know why God does it this way. I'm just going to do what God says. So I'm going to give you part two of the prophetic word. Now say, you you, you hear release, now say restore. The Bible is clear. And let me tell you something. Any prophetic word will line up with the Bible. If somebody says it's the word of God, then it ought to line up with the word of God. Okay? Okay? And the Bible is all about redemption. All the way from Genesis to Revelation, you will hear God is trying to rescue and redeem people. And so here is the word of God that the Lord placed into my spirit. You, Living Faith Church, 
your families, the individuals, and Northwest Arkansas. You are another chapter in my redemptive story. You are my treasured possession. Like Israel, my chosen, I long ago set my favor on you. Now, let me just pause right there and tell you that a little over 30 years ago, there was an evangelist that came by named Hollis Hopkins. He was the one that some of you, if you were here at that time, would remember, he made this statement that we always use. It's different when it happens at your house. Anybody ever heard that, us use that? That's where that came from. But in one of those services over when we were in that children's church building, he said, the word of God has said to me prophetically that out of Fayetteville is going to come a revival and revival is coming through this church. That was 30 years ago. I told you that four years ago, God reminded me and said, son, I'm bringing revival not to living faith, but through living faith. Like Israel, I long ago set my favor on you. Yet, everybody say yet. What does that mean? But still. But still. I set my favor on you, but still, now we're going to get into a little bit of trouble. You ready for God to get on to us? Yet you forgot my faithfulness and my goodness. You forgot it as a church. You forgot it as families. You forgot it as individuals. Oh, you love me, but you forgot my faithfulness. But I have now seen your repentance, and your renewed worship. I have noticed it, says God. My judgment and my discipline, you felt yet, everybody say, but still you have run back to me. You desire me, so today, in this time, I stay my hand. What does he mean? I stay my hand from judgment and discipline because you have learned the lesson. And when I gave you my discipline, you didn't run away from me. You didn't deny me. You ran to me. You ran to me as a church. You ran to me as families. You ran to me as an individual. You ran to me. And because of that, Northwest Arkansas and Fayetteville is going to see a revival come through you. You have run back to me. You desire me. So I stay my hand. I don't have to discipline today. You have returned to me, says God, and I am restoring to you what was lost. And here is the phrase. I am restoring your lost years. Yeah. And as a little bit of a student and heard my dad even preach, I thought, I I think there's a scripture for that. Now remember, if it's the word of God, it's going to be backed up by the word of God. So I begin to look, uh, he's going to restore the years. Uh, There's some years that have been lost. (laughs) But I'm restoring your lost years. Listen, here's what I wrote down as God had finished his statement of his prophetic word. I wrote down, God is performing his word presently and prophetically according to Joel chapter 2. And I begin to look at it. So I'm going to ask them to put Joel chapter 2 and we're going to start at verse 24 and I want you to read with me. It says, And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now let me stop right there. These are not only physical things that were happening in it that day, but there are, they are prophetic things that are happening right now. Spiritual things that are happening right now. So let me tell you, when it says the floors shall be full of wheat, this means it is a symbol of God's person and his work. Let me prove that to you by the word, that this is a symbol of Christ, his person and his work. John 12 and 24, Jesus is talking about himself. You can go and look at it on your own. Jesus is talking about himself in John 20 or 12 and 24. He says, unless a grain of wheat 
falls into the earth and dies. It remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Prophetically, he was saying, I am going to die. I have to die for people to have their sins removed. There has to be a sacrifice. But if I fall and I die, I'm going to raise up again. And because I died, there will be much fruit coming in the future. If I wasn't so winded, I'd run around this building right now. (laughs) The floor shall be full of wheat. Okay, so this house, every time we walk in here, in your house, when you begin to walk under your roof, in your car, on your job, in Fayetteville, when you're going from one business to another or another one restaurant to another, what you're going to find is, is everywhere you walk, the floors are full of wheat. They're full of the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. You're not having to wait to go to church to feel something and believe, well, there's a God. No, everywhere you step and everywhere you walk, God's going to be walking with you. And you're going to feel an anointing. I believe that signs and wonders follow them that believe. And because of the Word of God being present with you, and what's the Word of God? No, it's who's the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's John chapter 1, and that's talking about Jesus Christ. And everywhere you walk and whatever you set your hand to do, it's going to be connected with a power source that is eternal. And his name is Jesus Christ. Mm. Mm. Floors would be full of wheat. We walk in here, Jesus is going to be all over this place. And it ain't going to matter what light show we got going on, what song is happening or what message is being preached, Jesus is going to be there. Why? Because we draw near to him. He draws near to us. And the promise is there that in those last days, in Joel, he said, the floors, the threshing floors will be full of my presence. I tell you what, when you go home today, it ought, that statement right there ought to cause you to look at your house a little differently. You didn't walk away from the presence of God when you drove out of this parking lot. You're going to walk into your house and all of a sudden you're going to feel the same spirit that was in here this morning. (laughs) You're going to get a phone call and somebody of your family is going to be talking and you're going to begin to talk and the anointing is going to get all over you. And you're going to say things that only could be uttered by the Holy Spirit. Somebody's going to need to be healed. You're going to lay hands on them and they shall recover. (laughs) And God said, it's not my, I am not trying to appeal to your emotions. Let me tell you something. This is not an arrogant statement. Please don't take this. This is a confident statement. Okay. Because my confidence is in God. I don't care whether you believe what I'm saying or not. Because this is going to happen. Okay. But I'll tell you this. If you'll jump on board and you will get under that glory spout, God's got a destiny and a plan for your life, for your family. Okay. All right. Now, and the vats, or the the fats, or the skins, they will overflow with wine and oil. Now, this is, again, a physical prophecy and a spiritual prophecy. Physically, it's not only a prophecy for what was happening in that day, but physically, it's a prophecy for right now. Let me help you right here. So, for the broken, wine and oil symbolizes cleansing and healing. People are walking in this building every Sunday, every Wednesday. Right now, there are people that has walked in this building broken. 
Some of them have been broken by sin and they don't feel like there's any hope and they are lost without God. They are broken. There are also other people that are broken. They love God. They are redeemed. They are, God is their Lord, but they are broken because of the circumstances that are happening around them or in them. God says that in these days, the vats are going to be full of cleansing for the lost, <laughs> healing for the lost, cleansing for the believer, healing for the believer. There are some things, listen to me right now, there are some things that people in this house that are watching me online, you have battled with for years and years. It may be decades and you have battled them, but I'm telling you right now, there's a cleansing and a healing coming on you. The oil and the wine is being placed upon your life. <laughs> Woo! All right. Revelation 6, 5 and 6. For the believer, the wine and the oil represents souls in Christ. I want you to write that down. For the believer, wine and oil represents souls that are in Christ. Revelation 6, 5 and 6. Follow with me. Verse 5 says, and they can put it on the screen if they've got it. And when he had opened the third seal, who opened the third seal? Well, go ahead and read Revelation 6, 1. It says the Lamb of God began to open the seals. Okay? That's Jesus Christ. And when Jesus had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I looked and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. All right. The color black suggests starvation and death. We are in a world today that's full of starvation and death. But not only physically. And I'm not talking about third world countries. I'm talking about the United States. And spiritually, there is starvation and death. Let me go a little bit more to home. There are preachers and ministers and congregations and whole denominations that are starving and dying right now because they have forgotten that Christ must be Lord. The last five seconds, I've asked God not to have me say this because I didn't have this here. But I got to obey him. In this room, those that are watching, not everybody's going to make it. It breaks my heart. But I'm asking you, do whatever it takes to make it. Not to be religious, but to make sure that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter. There'll be people in the field. One will be taken and another left. There'll be two at the wheel knitting. One will be taken. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And Jesus said, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Depart from me. <sighs> okay. The color black suggests starvation and death. And the scales suggest something is being judged. You look on your courtroom doors. You look at monuments in front of different courts. And you'll see a lady there. She'll be holding a scale. It's a symbol 
of somebody is being weighed in the balance. Somebody has gone before a group of people, some magistrates, some peers, and somebody's making a decision on their life. Listen to me right now. When we stand before God, we will be judged. We will be weighed in the balance. And I'm asking us right now, let's submit to God judging us today so that we can be found faithful on that day. Let him fix the trouble in our life right now so that when he does judge us on that day, we'll hold our head up and say, judge on, O master. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And watch this. And see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. God says there's going to be a cost to be paid. It may cost a day's wage, it may cost a day of brokenness, it may cost a year's wage. It may cost a year of brokenness and trouble and trial. That's going to be the cost. But it says, see to it that you do not hurt the oil and the wine. And that, these are my children. And so we're going to go through pain and we're going to go through trial and we're going to go through trouble. But know this, we will not be defeated. We will not die. We will not be overcome. You got to be ready for whatever God's going to charge you. And whatever that cost is, you got to be willing to pay it individually and corporately. This church needs to be willing to pay it. I tell you what, our denomination needs to be willing to pay it. Your family needs to be willing to pay it. You need to be willing to pay it. But know this, whatever the cost is, and no matter how much pain that you go through and suffering you go through, you will not die and when this thing is said and done death and grave is in hell Satan is in hell and you are with the Lamb of God who has taken away your sins that's it verse 25 and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army. What the Lord said is that I have sent all of my armies that have taken away your resources. <laughs> the years have been lost. When the locust came, it took the seed from the year before that they sold up. It took the seed that was in the crown or rising up out of the crown. And because of that, that meant it took the seed for the future. Years were lost. And God did it. There's a lot of things that we need just to bow up and say, God, if you're in charge... This means maybe this wasn't the devil and it wasn't my neighbor and it wasn't my government. This was you putting me what I'm going through. Mama keeps saying that's okay. That's okay. That's what dad would say. That's okay. She's got a mat that says it's okay. Okay. That's what my dad was saying the last two days that's all he could get out when he, until he couldn't talk anymore. We'd tell him we'd cry and we'd pray and dad we love you. It's okay. That's all he could get out. It's okay. Why? It's okay. Okay. It's all right. Now the reason that it's all right is that God, he loves us <coughs> so much 
that he pulls back the provision. He pulls back what we think that we're able to do on our own. And now we find out we can't fix relationships. We can't seem to, uh, finances seem, seem to be fleeting. And our health seems to be fleeting. And all the trouble that's going on. And we've gone through years and he's pulled back that provision. Why? So that we would know that without him, we are nothing. And when we look at him and say, God, help me, then he runs right up and says, here I am. I will restore the years. Watch this. Some of you say, well, the past is the past. Can't do nothing about it. You're right. You can't do nothing about it, but God can. Because of some things that happened in the past, I'm not going to ever get my family back together. Oh, don't make God that small. <laughs> because of what I did, I'm a felon. I'll never be able to find a job. Uh-uh. She's my favorite cowboy. He wasn't caught but by his wife. But his wife is sitting right next to him. I'm talking about real stuff. And he lets me tell it, and I'll tell it a hundred more times. A little over 12 years ago, somewhere in that area. Is that right? 07. Okay, there you go. 07. He was in this room, but not because he wanted to be. It was his job. He was working for a food or a, a blood bank. And we were having one of those blood drives. And this man was driving the truck. He was there to set everything up and put everything away. When he got everything set up, he pulls backwards into the darkness over here in the corner where there was no lights. And he shoots up meth. That's him. And now he's right here. And I got a feeling, whereas every one of us might not have such a dramatic event, I know that I'm in a room that's filled to the capacity with people that if it had not been for Jesus, you wouldn't be here today. You would not be here today. Okay. God's got to deal with sin. But when his people repent, they find abundant blessing that is more than compensating for what was lost in the judgment. His grace abounds. Where your sin abounded, his grace does much more abound. And you, verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty. Everybody say plenty. plenty. Anybody know how to eat plenty? I've been eating a little too plenty. I'm going to have to go back, change my diet. I'm going to have to start counting some calories or something. Okay? Because I'm lifting the fork more than I'm lifting the weights right now. <laughs> and the fork is winning. Okay? All right, we're going to get that squared away. But listen, listen to me. Listen to me. You'll eat in plenty and be satisfied. How many of you ever went to a restaurant, got your food, ate it, paid the bill, walked out, you and your family looked at each other and went, that was terrible. I can't believe we paid that. Makes me so mad. I was going there because I thought it was a good place and, and I paid a little bit extra and I'm telling you, oh, it makes me so mad. I do not like it after I get from, Beth's not here, so I can tell on her a little bit, okay? All right, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> after church, we'll go to a restaurant. Where do you want to go? I don't care. 
we'll narrow it down after a little bit of intense fellowship. <laughs> because I don't care doesn't mean I don't care. It means I don't care, but don't pick this one, this one, this one, and this one. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So we'll finally nail one. And then we'll go. And we'll get done. And I can hardly tell. This had not been a good meal. And, I, and we'll get in the car. And I said, what you think? I didn't like it. I'm thinking, I don't want to pay that kind of money. And you tell me you don't like it. I don't want you to lie. But could you tell me sometimes? <laughs> you shall eat in plenty. You know what's happening? We're hearing podcasts. We're listening to songs. We're coming on each Sunday to our churches. We're hearing messages. We're reading in our scriptures. We're doing all these sort of things, and we're eating, and we're eating, and we're eating. We're taking in the word, and we're eating, and we're eating, and we're eating plenty, but we're still not satisfied. Now, why is it that we're not satisfied? I'm going to tell you. It's because our taste has changed. Okay. In sin, we have become satisfied. And listen to me. When I am in sin, I don't have an appetite for this. When I'm being disobedient, I don't have an appetite for this. But when I read in this and I'm enjoying this and life is coming out in this, then I don't have an appetite for sin. It's not in the middle. <coughs> it's one or the other. You have been ordained by God to be his steward, to be his manager. God said, I will feed you, you will have plenty, and you will be satisfied. How many are ready to walk out here? And every time you walk out of here, you don't have to ask anybody. Was it good to be in the house of God? It was just good to be in the house of God. Just good. I want you to stand with me. So I segue into stewardship. Now, we need to take a look at the Bible. We make sure we need to look at it in the right way. Do not look at the Bible as a set of laws. Don't look at it as a book of laws. Look at it as the book of life. Say that again. Don't look at the Bible as the book of laws. Look at it as the book of life. Why is that important? Because if you look at the Bible and you look at your faith as a bunch of laws... You will go from living a life of faith to living a life of compliance. Let that sit. You will now be trying to figure out how much can I do and how much can I not do and still make heaven. You'll want to just be in compliance, but you won't have a life of faith. The rich young ruler, he went to Jesus. He said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus went along with him. He said, The commandments shall not kill, shall steal, shall bear false witness, do the commandments. Master, all these I have kept from my youth. I'm going to make it. I'm good. And the Lord says, not so fast. He said, sell what you have. Give to the poor and follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away sorrowful. 
The Bible says the reason he went away sorrowful was because he had much possessions. But I'm going to tell you, his possessions had him. Now I'm going to ask you, this is the prayer call. I'm going to ask you, what is it that you have that is so prized and so valuable that you would miss heaven over What is it that is so important to you that you would rather have it than have a relationship with Christ? So I'm asking you here, listen to me. Don't tell me we can't be singing the goodness of God. I'm going to lay my crown down at Jesus' feet when I get to heaven when we cannot even lay our finances we cannot even lay our family we cannot even lay our hobbies down at the feet of Jesus listen to me this is not about you coming into a church this or another it's about whether or not you will be a manager of what is God's so say this with me everything God owns do you believe that everything God owns Dylan how many breaths have you taken since I've been preaching 36,205 why are y'all laughing Because he's being facetious, he's creating the joke. The, tr the answer is, I don't know. I don't know how many breaths. We have not even thought about the breaths that we have taken since I have been preaching. Why is that? It's because they are called an involuntary action. As a matter of fact, when you think about breathing, that's when it gets hard. I get nervous when the doctor says, breathe in, breathe in. Isn't it interesting that God created you and the way that you continue to exist day by day is of no will or power of your own. Every breath you take is God's. He created you to involuntarily do it so that you could never take credit for it. I am only here. My, my existence that's promised is one breath to the next. That's the only promise. Everything else, I don't know. So I'm asking you, before you breathe your last, and you don't know when it is, will you make sure that you're going to be a good manager of the soul that God gives you. If you're here today and you'd say, I don't know Jesus. I don't have him as my Lord and my master. I've had my life to be my own and I need to give my life to Christ. I want you to raise your hand. To give my, there you go, brother. Thank you. Thank you for being so strong. I want to tell you, there was one man in the prison Friday that raised his hand amongst all those other men when I gave the call. That was the first altar call that they had had that they remembered. Thank you, sir. You can put your hand down. I see you. God, see anybody else? I, I, I didn't want to miss you. So this whole service was meant for us, but I can promise you that this service was meant for you. every guy that you met right here, every song that you've heard, and whatever message, part of this message that you were blessed, the Holy Spirit was here for you. Okay? And now I'm going to ask the believers, how many of you will say, no reserves? I'm not going to hold anything. I'm going to give everything to God, no reserves. 
I'm not going to hold anymore. No reserves. My time, my talent, my treasures, everything is going to be God's. And I'm going to give it to Him And because I'm going to tell you it's what it's going to take because the prophetic word said, you can put your hands down, what the prophetic word said is that it's going to cost us something, but He promised us that we would be victorious, but you got to be willing to pay the price. So we're going to start with you, brother. We're going to pray this prayer, and I want you to pray this with us. Because the Bible says this, if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. With the heart, man believes to righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. All we got to do is believe and confess. And now you believers need to believe that God wants everything of you and confess that you will give everything to God. So we're going to pray this prayer, everybody together. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the only Son of God, the only Savior of the world. I believe only you can take away my sin. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I will follow you. I repent of my sin and I follow you today. I thank you, Jesus, that you made this day so that I could give my life completely to you. I honor you. I look forward to seeing you. Amen. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Steve, stay up real quick. I just feel led that we need to also have a prayer for Israel. And I felt like in my spirit that you as our pastor yes. lead us in that prayer for Israel and what's going on over there. Oh, praise God. I'm glad that you're... Oh, I'm sorry. I've got yeah, I got you. But I, I'm glad that you, you said that, Pastor Jonathan. Because it's been on my heart. You, you got to know this. That we have been grafted into the vine. Israel, the Jewish people, are God's chosen. But now, so are we. And for other... For, For us to have the favor of God, we have to be in line with His plan. And His plan is that Israel be saved. Yeah, that's His plan. And He's not changing from His plan. So listen to me. Just because somebody gets in their mind that they cannot live through life without having a piece of land that's only the size of New Jersey. Does it mean that God hadn't said, that's my people, I gave them that land, and nobody is taking it from me. Somebody says, this is a political war. No, it's not. This is a spiritual war. So let's pray. God of heaven, maker of the earth, owner of everything, the one who promised Abraham that he would be the father of many. God, I pray right now that you would show your mighty hand once again. This will not be the first time, God. You set precedent. You set precedent back in Abraham's day. You set precedent back in Moses' day. You set precedent back in Noah's day. That those who will seek to follow you and be in line with you, you will in no wise cast out, but you will protect and preserve. And so, Lord, I thank you for your people. And, Lord, I pray that Holy Ghost hedge of protection will be around them and their families. And, Lord, once again, make yourself known to the world that you are God through this victory. In Jesus' name.